Hello and welcome to this talk, Tuesday the 13th of December. Now we like to cover information and things going on in this channel related to health and well-being. And there's been a debate related to health and well-being that's been carried on just this evening in the UK uh, Parliament. And we're going to hear from Mr Andrew Bridgen, a uh, Member of Parliament for North West uh, Leicestershire. So over to Mr Bridgen now. Eminent and trusted cardiologists, a man with an international reputation, Dr Asim Malhotra, published peer-reviewed research that concluded that there should be a complete cessation in the administration of the COVID mRNA vaccines for everyone because of clear and robust data of significant harms and little ongoing benefit. He described the rollout of the biotech Pfizer vaccine as perhaps the greatest miscarriage of medical science, damage to population health, erosion of trust in public health and attack on democracy that we will witness in our lifetime. Interesting, Madam Deputy Speaker, there's not been a single rebuttal so far in the scientific literature to Dr Malhotra's findings, despite its widespread circulation and it making international news. Before I state the key evidence-based facts that make a clear case for complete suspension of these emergency use authorisation vaccines, it's important to appreciate the key psychological barrier as to why these facts have not been acknowledged by policymakers and taken up by the UK mainstream media. That psychological phenomenon is willful blindness. This is when human beings, including in this case institutions, turn a blind eye to the truth in order to feel safe, reduce anxiety, avoid conflict and protect their prestige and reputations. There are numerous examples of this occurring in recent history, such as at the BBC with Jimmy Savile, the Department of Health and Midstaffs, Hollywood and Harvey Weinstein, and specifically in, medical, in the medical establishment, the OxyContin scandal, which was portrayed in the miniseries Dope Stick. What's crucial to understand is that the longer willful blindness to the truth continues, the more unnecessary harm it creates. So here are the cold, hard facts on the mRNA vaccines and an explanation of the structural drivers that continue to be barriers to doctors and the public receiving independent information to make informed decisions about these vaccines. Since the rollout in the UK of the Biotech Pfizer mRNA vaccine, we have had almost half a million yellow card reports of adverse effects from the public. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is unprecedented and is more than all the yellow card combined reports of the last 40 years. Such an extraordinary rate of side effects, which are beyond mild, have been reported in many countries across the world that have used the Pfizer vaccine, including, of course, the United States. Of course, I'll give away to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank him for giving way. Um, I spoke to Alan Dutton beforehand. He knows my feelings about the vaccines. I, I'm a supporter of the vaccines. Uh, many of my family are as well. But I understand uh, where the Alan Dutton come from. I've had some constituents who have come to me. And does the Alan Dutton agree we need to ensure in this House we acknowledge risks and don't simply relegate them to fine print? It's absolutely right that those who feel they've been damaged by the, the vaccine should, of course, have the full support of their elected members of Parliament and, of course, the full support of the NHS. It's interesting that uh, only a couple of weeks ago I was interviewed by a journalist from a major uh, news outlet who said that he was being bombarded by calls from people who said that they were vaccine harmed but unable to get the support they wanted from the NHS. Um, and he also said that he thought this would be the biggest scandal in the medical history in this country. And disturbingly, he also said that if he were to mention that in the newsroom in which he worked, he would fear that he would lose his job. And it is this conspiracy of silence that we need to break. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's instructive to note that traditionally, according to pharmacovigilance analysis, uh, when it comes to serious adverse effects, what is actually reported by the public is thought to be only represent 
of the true rate of serious adverse events occurring within the population. The gold standard of understanding the benefit and harm of any drug comes from the randomised controlled trial. It's the randomised controlled trial conducted by Pfizer that led to the UK and international regulators approving the biotech Pfizer mRNA vaccine in the first place for administration. Contrary to popular belief, that original trial of approximately 40,000 participants did not show any statistically significant reduction in death as a result of vaccination. But it did show a 95% relative risk reduction in the development of infection against the ancestral, more lethal strain of the virus. However, the absolute risk reduction for an individual was only 0.84%. In other words, from their own data, <coughs> Pfizer revealed uh, that you needed to vaccinate 119 people to prevent one infection. The World Health Organization and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges have previously stated and made it clear that it's an ethical responsibility that medical information is communicated to patients in absolute benefit and absolute risk terms. This is to protect the public from unnecessary anxiety and manipulation. Very quickly, through mutations of that original strain, indeed within a few months, fortunately it became far less lethal. And it quickly became apparent that there was no protection against infection from the vaccine at all. And we were left with the hope that perhaps these vaccines would protect us from serious illness and death. So what does the most reliable data tell us about the best case scenario of individual benefit from the vaccine against dying from COVID-19? Real world data from the UK during the three-month wave of Omicron at the beginning of this year reveals that you'd need to vaccinate 7,300 people over the age of 80 to prevent one death. The number needed to be vaccinated to prevent a death in any younger age group was absolutely enormous. Will you give way? I will, of course, give way to my honourable friend. I'm very grateful to him for giving way and for, for bringing this debate to the House. It's a very important debate that we should be having. He's just talking there about the relative risks for different cohorts of the population. He will remember that when the vaccine was first announced, the intention was that it would only be used for those who, had, uh, who were vulnerable and the, and the elderly, uh, because, as he says, the expectation was that the, that the benefit to younger people was, was, was minor. Uh, do you think it would be helpful, does he, does he agree with me that it would be helpful for the Minister to explain to us why the original advice that the vaccines would only be rolled out for the older population and would not be used for children in particular, why that original advice was put, laid aside and we ended up with a rollout for the entire population, including children. I uh, thank my honourable friend, the member for devises, for that intervention and his support on this very important issue. Uh, of course, it's important that the government justify why they're rolling out a, a vaccine to any uh, cohort of people, in particular our, our, ch our children. Um, he will recall in the Westminster Hall debate that we, we questioned the validity of, of uh, vaccinating children who have minimal risk, at, if at all, from, from the virus, but there's a clear risk from the vaccine. And I will again report on evidence from America later in my speech uh, regarding those risks to, to particularly young children. Um, so, in other words, the benefits of the vaccine are close to, uh, to non-existent. Beyond the alarming yellow card reports, the strongest evidence of harm comes from the gold standard highest possible quality level data, a reanalysis of the Pfizer-Moderna's own randomised controlled trials using the MNRA technology published in the peer-reviewed journal Vaccine, revealed a rate of serious adverse events of 1 in 800 individuals vaccinated. These are events that result in hospitalisation, disability or a life-changing. What is most disturbing of all, however, is that of those original trials uh, suggesting that one was far more likely, someone was far more likely to suffer a serious side effect from the vaccine than to be hospitalised with the ancestral, more lethal strain of the virus. These findings, Madam Deputy Speaker, are a smoking gun suggesting that the vaccine should likely never have been approved in the first place. In the past, vaccines have been completely withdrawn 
uh, from use for a much lower incidence of serious harm. For example, the swine flu vaccine was withdrawn in 1976 for causing Willem Barre syndrome in only one in 100,000 adults. And in 1999, the rotavirus vaccine was withdrawn for causing a form of bowel obstruction in children affecting one in 10,000. With the COVID NRA vaccine, we're talking of a serious adverse event rate of at least one in 800, because that's the rate determined uh, in the two months that, uh, that Pfizer actually followed the patients following their vaccination. Unfortunately, some of those um, serious events affecting such as heart attack, stroke or pulmonary embolism will result in death, which is devastating for individuals and the families they leave behind. And many of these may take longer than eight weeks post-vaccination to show themselves. An Israeli paper published in Nature Scientific Reports showed a 25% increase in heart attack and cardiac arrest in 16 to 39 year olds in Israel. And, a, and another report from Israel, uh, show, which is looking at the level of myocarditis and pericarditis in uh, people who've had uh, COVID and those who hadn't. It was a study, I think, of 1.2 million who hadn't had uh, COVID and 740,000 who had had COVID. The incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis was in, identical in both groups. This would tell the House that uh, whatever is causing the increase in, uh, in heart problems now, it's not due to having been infected with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, it was accepted by a peer-reviewed medical journal that one of the nation's most respected and decorated general practitioners, honorary vice president of the BMA, and the Labour Party's Doctor of the Year, Dr Kailesh Chand, likely suffered a cardiac <coughs> arrest and was tragically killed by the Pfizer vaccine six months after his second dose through a mechanism that rapidly accelerates heart disease. In fact, in the UK, Madam Deputy Speaker, we've had an extra 14,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in 2021 compared to 2020 following the vaccine rollout. Many of these will undoubtedly be because of the vaccine and the consequences of this MRA jab are clearly serious and common. The Ministers... Can my uh, honourable friend give way? I will, yes. I'm very grateful and I think he's making a, a very interesting and important speech and in particular he's giving a, a lot of detail about the Pfizer vaccine. Does he have similar concerns uh, about other vaccines uh, and, and if so uh, will he be talking about those later in his speech? Um, I thank my honourable friend for that uh, interjection. Clearly um, this is relating to all mRNA um, vaccinations. He will be well aware that many of us will have had the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine that has effectively been withdrawn uh, because of uh, health concerns around. Indeed, I'm, I'll declare to the House I'm double vaccinated with AstraZeneca, which has now been withdrawn. Um, the ministers uh, may understandably wish to ref defer responsibility for a decision such as withdrawing uh, the vaccines from the population to the regulators, such as the MN MHRA, or in America it would be the FDA. Um, historically, when undertaking the approval of any drug, the regulators themselves ultimately end up relying on the summary results of the drug companies in their sponsored trials, where the raw data is kept commercially uh, confidential. Furthermore, the MHRA has a huge financial conflict of interest, receiving 86% of its funding from the pharmaceutical industry they are supposed to regulate. In, a, in effect, Madam Deputy Speaker, we've got the poacher paying the gamekeeper. As pointed out in, in a recent BMJ investigation into the financial conflicts of interest of, of the drug regulators, sociologist uh, David Donald Light said of them, it's the opposite of having a trustworthy organisation independently and rigorously assessing medicines. They're not rigorous, they're not independent, they're selective and they withhold data. Doctors and patients must appreciate how deeply and extensively drug regulators can't be trusted so long as they're captured by the industry funding. Similarly, another investigation revealed that members of the JCVI have huge financial links to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, running to billions of pounds. The ministers, the media and the public know that the foundation itself is heavily invested in the pharmaceutical industry stocks. Unfortunately, the catastrophic mistake over the approval and the coercion associated with this emergency use 
authorisation, medical intervention, is not an anomaly, but in many ways it could have been predicted by structural failures that have allowed this to occur in the first place. These shortcomings are rooted in the increasingly unchecked, visible and invisible power of multinational corporations, in this case Big Pharma. We start by acknowledging that the drug industry has a fiduciary obligation to produce profit for their shareholders. Madam Deputy Speaker, they have no fiduciary obligation to provide the right medicines for patients. The real scandal is that those with a responsibility to patients and scientific integrity, namely doctors, academic institutions and medical journals, collude with the industry for financial gain. Big Pharma exerts its power by capturing the political environment through lobbying, the knowledge environment through funding university research and influencing medical education, preference shaping through capture of the media, financing, think tanks, etc. etc. In other words, the PR machinery of pharma excels in subterfuge, engages in smearing and deplatforming those who call out their manipulations. No doubt, Madam Deputy Speaker, they will be very busy this evening. It's no surprise that because of so much control by an entity that has been described as psychopathic for its profit-making conduct, that one analysis suggests that a third, the third most common cause of death globally, after heart disease and cancer, is because of the side effects of prescribed medications which were mostly avoidable. Because of these system- systemic failures, doctors often receive biased information, deliberately manipulated by the pharmaceutical industry, that exaggerates the benefits and minimises and, and, and also exaggerates the safety of their drugs. Furthermore, the former editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, claims that research misconduct is rife and is not effectively being tackled in the UK institutions, stating, he states, something is rotten in British medicine, and it has been for a long time. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's also been brought to my attention by a whistleblower from a very reliable source that one of these institutions is covering up clear data that reveals the mRNA vaccine increases inflammation of the heart arteries. They are covering this up in fear that they may lose funding from the pharmaceutical industry, The lead of that cardiology cardiology research department has a prominent leadership role uh, with the British Heart Foundation and I'm very disappointed to say that that he has sent out non-disclosure agreements to his research team to ensure that this important data never sees the light of day. This, Madam Deputy Speaker, is is an absolute disgrace. Such systemic failure uh, in an over-medicated population also contributes to huge waste of British taxpayers' money and increasing strain on the NHS. Will you give way? I will give way on that point. It's been very good with this time. I just wanted to call this attention to the research that I chair the All Party Parliamentary Group on prescribed drug dependency, and he, he refers to the waste of money. There's £500 million being spent every year by the NHS on prescribed drugs for people who shouldn't be on those habit forming pills. Enormous human misery as well as waste for the taxpayer. Thank my honourable friend for making a point which only reinforces uh, the, the items in my speech which the public need to know and I thank him again for his support. We, we clearly need uh, an inquiry into the, uh, the uh, influence of Big Pharma on medications and our NHS and this has been called for uh, on many occasions indeed, by some very, very influential people in, including uh, prominent physicians in, such as the former president of the Royal College of Physicians and personal doctor to our former Queen, Sir Richard Thompson. On a separate occasions in the last few years, these calls have been supported also and covered in the Daily Mail, the Guardian, and most recently the, the I newspaper. We're not just fighting for principles of, of ethical, evidence-based uh, medical practice here, but we're also fighting for our democracy. The future health of the British public depends on us tackling head-on the cause of this problem and finding meaningful solutions. In 2015, a commentary by Richard Horton, editor-in-chief of The Lancet, suggested that possibly half of the published medical literature may simply be untrue. He wrote that science has taken a turn towards darkness and asked who is going to take the first step to clean up the system. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, that first step could start this evening with, with this debate. It starts here and the vaccine minister and the government ensuring in the first instance that there needs to be an immediate and complete suspension of any more COVID vaccines and their use 
of mRNA technology. Madam Deputy Speaker, silence on this issue is, is more contagious than the virus itself. Um, and I'd also, now so should courage be. And I would implore all the scientists, the medics, the nurses, and those in the media who, uh, who know the truth about the harm these vaccines are causing to our people to speak out. Madam Deputy Speaker, we've already sacrificed, in my view, far too many of our citizens on the altar of ignorance and unfettered corporate greed. Uh, last week, the MHRA authorised these experimental vaccines for use on children as young as six months. A report, which I've already quoted in a Westminster Hall debate some weeks ago by the Journal of American Medical Associations, studying the effects of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccination on children under five years of age, showed that one in 200 had an adverse event which resulted in hospitalisation and had symptoms that lasted longer than 90 days. As the data clearly shows, to anyone who wants to look at it, the mRNA vaccines, they're not safe, they're not effective, and they're not necessary. I implore the government to halt their use immediately, and as I've demonstrated, and the data clearly shows, the government's current policy on the mRNA vaccines is on the wrong side of medical ethics, it's on the wrong side of scientific data, and ultimately, Madam Deputy Speaker, it will be on the wrong side of history. Hopefully we'll have some more of that debate uh, shortly on the channel. Um, they were the views of Mr Andrew Bridgen, Member of Parliament. Thank you for watching.